Did you know that there are more than 800 million parking spaces here in the United States? And you're probably parked in one of them right now. But which one? That question may not be too hard in a church parking lot, but even here at a church parking lot, you might forget if you parked on the left side or the right side of the parking lot when you go out the door. But think about Disney World. There, there are over 46,000 parking spots. And a good number of people always forget where they park, which row, which lot they're parked in. Visitors arrive all revved up, ready to go into the park, and they don't take notice of where they're parked at. And they get more impatient with how slow the parking is going and just don't take notice of where they're at. In addition to that, they may have a rental car that they've not noticed uh, the color or the make of that car either. So it may be identical to several hundred others in close proximity. Disney employs a whole army of people to try to help these absent-minded visitors figure out where they park. They remind them constantly. Each parking lot at Disney World is named after a Disney character. You know, Chip and Dale and Goofy and Pluto and Dopey and so forth. And they're clearly identified with big pictures at each parking lot. Arriving guests, when they board the trams to head into the park, the tram driver announces, you're boarding tram so-and-so from parking lot so-and-so. Please take note. And still, so many people fail to remember. So Disney employs a small army, like I said, of people that they call the parking cast whose job it is, is to reassure flummoxed folks and reunite them with their autos. The parking cast. Can you believe that? Who other than Disney would create an uh, entertainment event called Finding Your Lost Car? This parking cast uses a variety of tools from perseverance to technology to eliciting from park uh, from the guests themselves what they noticed on the way in for starters Disney fills up their lots in a certain order and so when a lot gets full they know when that lot is full so if the parking guests can figure out approximate time of arrival at least that narrows it down to a couple parking lots that they can find their vehicle in also, Disney workers um, also asked them if they've noticed some things as they were driving into the parking lot that may help them locate which specific parking lot. They asked them if they have OnStar and suggest that they call that global positioning system so that they can pinpoint their car. And finally, sometimes Disney employees just put them in the company vehicle and drive up and down the rows while the guest hangs out the window with their parking fob when the pa hitting the panic button, hoping that the alarm will go off. One way or another, Disney usually, find, uh, usually manages to relink persons with their vehicles. Finding that which was lost and enabling the park goers to go on their happy way. And no matter what lot they were parked in, most of them feel that they were parked in Dopey. Now, I don't know if these uh, cast uh, parking, if the parking cast has a favorite. Uh, Bible story or not, but the little parable from today's gospel lesson may serve as one of their, as a good candidate for them. The story of a lost sheep and whose value was on that lost one, how much value was placed on that lost one, and then rejoicing that happens when the lost is found. 
their emotions kind of express the, and parallel the emotions of uh, parking guests there. You know, consternation over the lost, determination to find the lost, and then rejoicing when the lost is found. But, do you think the parking guests has a party when they find the lost vehicle for the guest? I mean, for them, it's all in a day's work. I doubt that they party every time they succeed. And as for the chagrined guests, you know, finally stumbling upon their lost transport probably brings with them a, a wave of relief and maybe a, a wave of reprieve, but I doubt there's much joy there, embarrassed as they are. So when Jesus asks, which one of you would not have a party, a lot of us would probably have to confess that we would not. I mean, how do you react when you find something that you've lost? Like most of us, we've probably all lost certain things. Keys, glasses, pens, books, socks, shoes, sandals, a myriad of things. How do, you, uh, how do you react when you find them? Do you throw a party? Was that warranted when finding different things? Diane and I once lost the juicing attachment to our KitchenAid for two years before we accidentally found it in one of our closets there. But we didn't have a party. The outcome in this parable actually seems unreal, doesn't it? Or, as the theme for our sermon series in the next coming weeks here, seems a bit upside down, over the top, out of proportion, unlike the real world. And there are several reasons why. For one, we just don't identify with the shepherds. Oh, sure. A lot of people get attached to their pets, and it's not unreasonable to assume that the shepherd may have had some favorite animals of the flock. But knowing this, the shepherd searching for the missing sheep was more than just trying to keep his flock profitable. The finding of the lost sheep became a source of joy because without that sheep, for the shepherd the flock would no longer be whole. I mean, which one of you, in having lost your animal companion and then finding again, doesn't maybe call up a friend or at least post it on Facebook that you are happy that you have been reunited with your companion? And we also have a hard time identifying with those that have little in life. We have dozens of pins. If we miss one, it's no loss. We just pick up another one. And even those things that we might not have extras of, you know, maybe reading glasses or a, a garlic press or nail clippers, it's often easier just to go buy a new one than it is to spend time searching for the lost one. But not so in the first century. People owned far fewer things, and the loss of one sheep may be financially ruinous at times. In my younger days, I served at a church camp that uh, welcomed in those from the low-income area. And every year, we would send out a list of items to bring. You know, uh, bring your um, soap and towel, bring a flashlight, bring rain gear, and things like that. But with every new group that came in, there were always some who didn't have the things on the list. You know, some said, well, their families just couldn't find them. One boy proudly showed me his toothbrush, explaining that it was on loan from his brother since he didn't have one. So what child in that circumstance 
having misplaced his toothbrush and then finally finding it, wouldn't go to his brother and say, be glad with me because I lost this toothbrush, but now I've found it. After which the older brother would probably still grab him and rough him up a bit for losing the toothbrush in the first place. But finally here, and here's where we get to the heart of our gospel this evening, it's just not easy to identify with God. The parallel to this parable in Luke kind of gives us the summary of this parable in which Jesus says that when one sinner repents, the whole of heaven rejoices. The seeking of the one lost while the 99 remain is an occasion of joy in finding that one beyond comprehension because this is God's kingdom and God's kingdom is upside down compared to our fallen world. Why worry about one? I mean, after all the members of the human race that God has created over the years, God still experiences such celebration over the conversion of one single individual. Why is one person so significant in the light of the billions of faithful who have already died in the faith? What is so important about one person? I think of it this way. Do you think Bill Gates finds joy in finding a penny on the sidewalk when he has billions stashed away already? I read somewhere that if Bill Gates bent down to pick up a $20 bill off the sidewalk, he would be losing money. He makes so much money per second that the three seconds it would take for him to bend down and pick it up, he would lose $400. With that in mind, why would God rejoice over finding one lost sheep? Why would he jeopardize the 99 for the one? 1 Timothy 2.4 God's will is that all people be saved and come to the knowledge of him. God cares about the one because it is his will. God cares about the one because that one is his creation. God cares about the one because he or she is his son or daughter. God cares about the one because his son bled and died for that one on the cross. God is not willing to lose even one person because all are precious to him. God knows every person by name. And that includes you. God cares about you and does not want you to be lost to the devil. He has sought you out. He may have placed you in a Christian family where you were baptized and raised in the Christian faith. Some he may have used a friend or a neighbor or a relative to find you. He may have used life circumstances to bring you out in the open so that he could find you. The point is, God cares about you, small though you think you are. And then, when even a single sinner repents and turns to God in faith, God experiences joy. There's going to be a party in heaven this evening when we confess and repent of our sins. This parable confirms that. For those that are guests that were lost in the parking lot at Disney there, 
Sometimes the guests are really more lost than their cars are. They walk up to the parking cast and say, I don't know where I parked. I don't know what my car looks like. I don't know what to do next. But the parking attendants, like the good shepherd, purposefully go about their work of helping the lost to become found. Jesus lets us know in this parable, in God's inside-out, upside-down kingdom, he is about the business of seeking us just as purposefully. And that is great news for us, whether we're parked in dopey or dopely wandering about, wondering where we are. God looks for us because it's his great joy to find us. And when God finds us, there is a party in heaven, one more joyful than any parking cast could ever engineer. And so may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.